Hello everybody and welcome back to the Biff Rugby League podcast. It's episode 9 and it's been a busy couple of weeks. We've had coaches in, not many coaches, sorry, coaches out I should say, not many coaches in. League 1 kicked off and Wakefield have won three games on the bounce and we're just as shocked as you are at that as well. But before we get into everything we've got to talk about this week, how are we both? Have we enjoyed the last two weeks? Yeah, having a, having a weekend off in between this and you feel fresh and ready for this one and yeah just had a challenge cup weekend which was uh which i, I thought was uh really good to see so many games on tv and um i think really highlighted uh some good points of rugby league so it's been a positive week i think yeah and your north Wales crusade has got off to a pretty decent start in the in league one you've only lost once in all competitions this year so that must be pretty exciting and obviously cornwall up at the weekend which we'll go into a bit later on um, do you think do you think that'll be a bit of a uh, we, we will talk about it later on and I don't want you to give me a prediction but do you think you're looking forward to that seeing a new team come and playing at you guys set for their first game oh, I'll be interested with it being you know it could end up being a part of history but it's uh, that Cornwall side is uh, looking like it struggled to beat some universities currently so wow well we look forward to seeing what your prediction is later on um, but we may as well crack straight on and we'll, we'll go into the story of the round. And Robin, you've got a slightly different one for us this week. It's not necessarily something that's been front and centre of the sport, but it's something that has been brought back this year. Yeah, so yeah, some of that's sort of flown under the radar a little bit, but it's super important. Um, and that's the return of res- reserve grade fixtures this year. Uh, obviously, this is the first time since the, uh, the pandemic struck um, and the competition, it's made up of 13 teams. It's the, the 12 clubs currently running academies and Salford. Uh, and the fixtures, it kind of runs alongside the academies. The, the academy is the under 18s competition. Uh, and it runs alongside that. So each, each fixture staggered. So no team is going to have more than one sub first team match per weekend. Um, and it, the idea is to give players the. Uh, within the structure, appropriate playing opportunities. Um, And so the idea of the uh, reserve grade is to sort of like bridge the gap between the academies and and, uh, and the the first team, the open age. Uh, Basically, the problem that we've had without a reserve grade is that the academy runs up to 18 and then you've got players that are between sort of 19 to maybe 21, 22, 23 that are not quite ready to play first team, but they've got nowhere to, to play and play competitively. So um, this coming back has sort of given us a, a, a better pathway for those players uh, on their path towards um, the first grade. So this, the, the actual structure of the season itself, um, it will have a, a playoff series and a grand final at the end of the year. So that's going to um, create these high pressure uh, matches and recreate kind of the top level season structure and give um, players and the coaches a, a chance to develop. And also with the grand final, hopefully there'll be a little bit more support or interest. Uh, and as I said, it's re- really important. It gives a full pathway. Um, but there is obviously, it's rugby league, there's some debate. Is it, is it the right way to do it? Is it necessary? We saw um, just before the pandemic, so um, in like 2018, we saw a lot of clubs actually stop the reserve grade. They decided it was um, not a worthy return on their investment. Um, one, the Huddersfield managing director in 2019, he he forecasted it would cost an additional £100,000 to run a, 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 a reserves grade, which um, I think is an overshoot. Everywhere else I've read is around sort of thirty to £40,000. So it's not a massive investment. And when you consider that um, it's so important to sort of stop all these players from um, not fulfilling their potential, and like you know, we, we might lo- we lose players at this at this really crucial time. Um, but people argue that maybe dual registration is a better way of doing it. That's where players, uh, two clubs, sort of like a top level club and maybe a championship or a league one club, they join up, they partner up. And the players that aren't getting regular games with the first grade from the top clubs will then go and play um, in the championship in the League One to get experience. Um, but 
there's people don't like that because it sort of changes squads really regularly in the championship and the championship is a, is a competitive competition in itself so it's still difficult for a 19 year old to get first uh, to get game time in the championship um but um hopefully yeah hopefully this will work so in, in australia sorry i'll just quickly mention they they use a, a reserve grade model and obviously they've got so much more money so a lot of these reserve players are um, paid full time and so they have they can almost afford to wait and see if they develop or not um, and it's also a, a quite competitive competition and allows um, first teamers that maybe are a bit off form coming back from an injury to they also get competitive games so it kind of works in both ways so really for me the ideal situation is is a reserve grade comp and um with more money it would it would have more investment but i just think it sort of deserves a little bit more publicity because it, the idea of it is to prepare these players to play in the in the, in the first grade 100%. obviously they're getting the match day experience they're getting the season structure it's it's exactly the same for the coaches but i think it, it's a really the media is something that's really important as well to manage as a professional athlete and so a few more interviews, a few more, you know, t- tagging them onto games so you get a double header, it surely can't be a bad thing. I think that it needs to be pushed a little bit more, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree. A question I have for you, it's a question that popped into my head. If we'd have had the reserve grade in the last two, over the last two seasons, obviously, and maybe, I don't know when, when you said it, they stopped it. Do you think the likes of Jack Wellsby and Lewis Dodd and, and these young maybe even Will Price, do you think they would have jumped onto the scene as early as they have done? Do you think they would do you think the clubs or do they yeah. think they would have had a season or two in the reserves? Like it makes it like, these players are coming on and they're in, and they're gonna be in and around the England squad well, maybe not Price now, which we'll get into in a bit later on. But Dodd and Wellsby, for example, they're gonna be in England squad at the end of the year, most likely. Yeah. Do you think they would have been in England squad at the end of this year if we hadn't if we'd have had the reserves grade? Yeah, I think looking at those players is it, they're like they're the top of the top. I think yeah. they were always going to make it into the first team. And the path for them, actually, has probably never been clearer. You finish the academy and you go straight up to first grade and you get you mm. get game time. It's the ones that are not quite ready yet that we, that this that's what this is for. So I think we could have had the reserves. Those those guys that you've mentioned would have they, they're good enough to play, so they would have they would have got up there. It, it, um, we potentially have lost players over the last couple of years because of this because we haven't had the reserve grade in place and that that's that's the talent drain that we're we're not we're not capturing the top players are always going to make it yeah definitely and and it's really good i've always sort of enjoyed when i was younger getting the 40 20 and whatever the magazines that used to get rugby league world and looking at all the fixtures that they used to put in the back and see and you'd have super league super league reserves super league academy it'd be like I think they used to look like the alliance, so it was the it was the jump between the academy and the super league, and you'd have sometimes like injury injured players that had had six months off come back and play an alliance game or sorry an academy game or whatever before playing in a super league game in a couple of weeks. One of one of those and it's, yeah go on. It, I think it should be rewarded a bit more. I think if you if like if at the moment the Wakefield are doing quite well in the reserve comp. Like, I feel like it should be praised a little bit more in, to kind of encourage these clubs to invest because at the end of the day they're investing in the future and those players might not stay at Wakefield but if you're if you're a team that doesn't have a reserve uh, mm. team then you're relying on other on, 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 on other clubs competition. so you owe you owe that competition something because they're providing you with the next generation of players so the need I feel like there needs to be a bit more publicity and a little bit more reward to encourage um teams to like build up their reserve grade and, and yeah I just think I think I think it's flown under the radar and it's a shame because they could have brought it back this year and tried to make something of it and mm. I think it's just sort of n- nothing nothing's really, really gone of it you say nothing's really come of it a player that man that had a run out earlier in the season for for a reserve side that's now we'll get into is that is I'll say it now he's our player of the round for the last two weeks like the, he's it's going to be sort of a player of the fortnight, but we're going to call it player of the round. Mason Lino, has, he's done something at Wakefield. He's come back from his injury and they've won three games on the bounce, two of which against Warrington away at the Halliwell Jones. 
usually if you beat if a team beats you at home and they come back to visit you in a week or a couple of weeks time you've figured out how to beat them because you've just played them and they've just beat you so you know you know what you should do Warrington didn't manage to do that and Mason Lino with a try nine goals and a bag full of assists over 160 minutes like proper winding the, the Warrington Wolves fans up as well well and truly deserved Toby I want to get your thoughts on on Lino because when he came in he he had a little bit of NRL experience not as much as Austin or Frawley or Caesar had when they come over but Lino's come in and he's and he's done a decent job because he was always he always caught the eye a little bit at the Knights, didn't he? Yeah, you could argue that he, he, he caught the eye um, a little bit. Um, I think he ended up sort of getting he was a bit undersized, ended up getting used at hooker a little bit. Um, sort of was a third or fourth choice half and was never really like electric on the ball. He was very much just sort of you know he'd come in, he'd catch and pass, he'd put in your sort of basic kicks, and that was him. Um, when Wakefield signed him, it was I, I don't think he was even the best half out of contract half back that they could have signed that year. Although I'd have to do a bit more, spend a bit more time to remember who the free agent class were that year. But I remember it being a sort of underwhelming signing and something where you know I don't think he was going to come and light up. Which is ironic, at Wakefield a few years ago had Sam Williams, and he was a player I thought really could have accelerated them forward, and yeah. it didn't quite work out for him. Um, yeah, he came in. Um, you know, last season I wouldn't say he did anything which was which put him in a very sort of special category. Um, although obviously Wakefield liked him enough to to keep him on for this year, and yeah, he seems to uh, really have um, worked hard during that injury period to make sure that he came back fantastic this year, um, beating Warrington twice, which I think ruined us on the predictions. Uh, <laughs> Well, it ruined it ruined you two. I went for Wakefield after watching them beat them the week before. I was like, I've got to go Wakey on this one. I trusted them to to do a handful, and it's really helped me this week. He's played three times for Samoa, Mason Lino, you know, between two thousand and sixteen and two thousand and nineteen. World Cup's coming up at the end of the year. If he continues in this form, we'll see him, won't we, in October? I mean, who's the other option? Um, the uh, what? Current squad, current squad in the half spot. They got uh, Farmanua Brown and Chanel Harris Devita. That was the teams that played before, and, and Anthony and Anthony Milford. Like he, Masonino is in the current squad, but he hasn't played a lot. He hasn't played a game for Samoa since 2019, but he's only played six times. Oh, sorry, uh, three three times or six times. I just said I can't remember. Maybe I don't know. I think, I think he's a backup if anything um, happens to uh, Anthony Milford. I think they're quite similar players where they've got both got that sort of good running game, but also can lead. So I think I think he's a a good a good backup to have for Milford. But for me, Milford still gets the spot. Yeah, I, have to, I think I have to agree. I mean, he's he's such a quality player, but I, I would like to see him at the World Cup in and at the end of the year. He's he's electric, and the fans in this country will know him as well. So it's the fact that. People who watch yeah. Super League will know him, and he and to see if he gets named in that squad, people go, "Ah, oh, I've always wanted to see Mason Lino play." But they might not know who, if they don't watch the NRL, they're not going to know who Chanel Harris Tavita is because he's not a household name in terms of when you think rugby league halfbacks. He's not one of the first ten names that pop into your head. Whereas fans in this country will probably go, "Ah, oh, Mason Lino's not bad," after the last two games that he's played, which is which is really weird to say because I kind of forget that Harris Tavita's one of the best players in his position on a good day. But, you know, that that's probably a topic for a little bit later in the season when we start looking at the squads that have been picked for the World Cup. But it's it's time to move on again, and it's Hall of Fame time. And I don't know which one of you wants to start this. Um, I think I might give it to Toby because of his first ever trip to this place. Um, and the Hall of Fame inductee this week is Old Trafford, the, the grand final stadium and the Theatre of Dreams. Toby, tell us why you threw this one into the pot the last minute after we didn't really, we couldn't really think of someone to throw in. Yeah, so I think my first, um, I mean, I mean, I got into rugby league uh, initially when Crusaders were in the Super League um, as a slightly different club. Um, so my, my first Super League game outside of the Crusaders home game, um, well, it was actually, it was in the other side of Manchester, 
but once you'd sort of, once at uh, Magic Weekend and once I'd sort of once we me and my dad had enjoyed that um, and we realised that you can get grand final tickets pretty cheap if you get them quite early on um, we went for about five, four, five, six consecutive years um, to Old Trafford um, and I just like I think it's just being in that big stadium especially I think I was probably 12 uh, or 13 um, at the time of that first final which uh, the grand, first grand final I went to and you're in the stadium it's a huge occasion and there's the flames going up I mean <laughs> the RFL must have a big storage unit somewhere to keep those flame cannons um, <laughs> you know the flames going up you can feel the heat um, from them and like this is just what I remember as sort of my first experience and then yeah it's just such a big occasion and you've got like the fans on either side of the stadium and they're waving flags and you've got uh, you know so that anyway and yeah so my first grand final was um I, I think it was 2013, but I, you might have to correct me on the year. But it was the year that Ben Flower created the most watched rugby league <laughs> clip in Sky Sports history. And um, decided to just deliver um, a, number, uh, a pair of punches, uh, one to an unconscious uh, St. Helens. <laughs> uh, it was absolutely disgraceful, but I'll tell you what, as a moment... Big moment. It, uh, it was just something which made that well it made the rest of the game pretty dull actually but <laughs> the start of that game just so wild and like an electric atmosphere and I think I think Old Trafford is probably most the biggest atmosphere you get in a stadium. Um barring maybe when Catalans got there. <laughs> um yeah. Year, but, we, but we love you Catalans. Yeah um, we do, we definitely do. Yeah. Um but yeah so it's just I think it's just the place where you get the best atmosphere, and it's it's managed to be a mainstay of rugby league grand, super league grand finals since super league existed, which is actually quite a credit when you consider how you can't even hold down good spots to power who host Magic Weekend every year and things like that. So, yeah, fantastic. It's just a fantastic venue, and I think it's it's the part of our game which I think at the end of the year gets you excited for the next season and once the season's we start playing loop fixtures and the season's got a bit boring all of a sudden the old, old Trafford just brings you right back ready for the next season to start yeah definitely um, before Robin goes into his I can see him wearing trying to think of a grand final moment mine's got to be from 2011 and that that Rob Borrow try like just using his just hit just to duck underneath the tackle and sprint away and kick it off for Leeds, and as they beat Saints in 2011, to, to regain the, the title. After winning it two years in a row, and then not winning it in 2010, to come back and regain the title in 2011, in in a team that was arguably one of the best rugby league dynasties like of, of, of like forever, up until 2015, arguably now being matched by the St. Helens side of this year, last year, and the year before, and the year before that. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal reason to just. It's just, it's just amazing to go there. I've not been for so long, and I really want to get there again. And I just, in a way, I kind of wish that that Jack Wellsby try had been at Old Trafford as well. Like being played in front of no, was it in front of no fans, an empty, like KCOM Stadium. Imagine that in front of Old Trafford, in front of the Saints fans who are always at that end. Like that would have been absolutely phenomenal, Robin. Let let's finish off with this whole this Hall of Fame inductee with your best. Well, maybe not. It might, I reckon yours is going to be an Old Trafford moment. I reckon it's going to be a football match or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I went to see Ollie Mays. And... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. No, I I mean I I was at the um, at the I obviously saw. Same flowers punched him down to high on the floor. That was uh, that's uh, I'll never forget that. Um, but mine sort of links onto yours actually, Brad. So in 2011, I watched the grand final in a pub, and, <laughs> I, and I saw that Borough try, and it just sparked my imagination. And got I, I, it was just like I, it was just history happening in front of your very eyes. And so I said to my dad, like, we have to go to Old Trafford next year. And obviously, this is when we were kids, so I wasn't paying for it. So I had to pester him all year to go back. So we, so I managed to convince him. We went in 2012. Uh, so that was my first time at Old Trafford. I think it was probably my first time in Manchester, to be honest. 
<laughs> and just like loved the atmosphere. And um, I was sort of like thinking to myself, like, you know, Leeds, seeing Borough do that for Leeds, like, is he going to do it again? But instead, I got a, a Sinfield masterclass. And it turned out to be one of the, the classics, you know, it was it was 14 all at half time. There was battles all over the place. Carl Abler completely dominated Lee Breers. And I don't think I don't think it you know, he wasn't really spoken about, but you could just see him just like in every opportunity. Yeah, hundred percent. Like it's such a big it's such a big stadium, but like you see it you see everything there. It's just like encapsulating. So it that's that was like my first old Trafford experience. So a great game. Again, that great lead side. Um and yeah, I've enjoyed I've, every time we go. It's, it's the jewel in the crown for us, isn't it? It's like our it's our Super Bowl. Yeah, and and it also will be the host of the Rugby League World Cup final in November as well. Both the women's and the men's finals will be played at Old Trafford, and I believe me and Robin are both going. And Toby is yet to buy any World Cup tickets, so everyone get on Toby like anywhere if you see him about. If you're like, oi. Get some get some tickets for these games. Like we don't care if you're a student and you've got no money. Like you need to be there. The Sit at the back. Like get in the cheap seats. Like restricted <laughs> restricted view and everything else. Uh, Toby, we did. We need to move on to one of your favourite topics, though. Uh, we need to move on to the not watch NRL NRL watch. That stuck. That wasn't meant to stick, but that stuck. <laughs> yeah, the not watch NRL. Yeah, it's a. Uh, <laughs> it's back uh, after it took a bit of a hiatus. Um, it's, it's been a month um, since we spoke about the NRL, really. Wow. Um, and yeah, so I mean, this what we've already sort of touched, I guess, on this topic a little bit. Um, but the NRL in round three, which was last weekend as we're recording this, they made the um, the theme of the round sort of heritage, and they put a lot of the clubs put a real focus on identifying the nations of all. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! What's going on? Oh, he's dropped out. Don't do this to us. What's going on? Just going through the gears when he's getting just up to speed. He was just getting up to speed. I know what he was about to talk about. He was about to talk about the NRL players and where they could potentially represent if they if there was no such thing as Australia and New Zealand and we kind of touched on this a little bit at the end of last season didn't we um, I'm kind I'm kind of hoping he'll fill himself back in um, and if he doesn't then oh he's dropped out he's dropped out but Robin's still in the same position so that's fine um, but yeah he's sort of touching on players that could play for other nations and I'm just looking on the he can play for Twitter and if you don't follow um, he can play for on Twitter do it because you don't he, he, he it's, it's such a beautiful website to look at the, like the, the main he's done some Morocco ones he's done some like, and well the one I'm looking for here is Germany like did you know that there's five NRL players who could play for Germany um, and one of them is Scott Drinkwater one of them is Dylan Brown and one of them is David Klemmer like imagine having the Drinkwater brothers, Dylan Brown, David Klemmer, Asu Kapoa, Josh Corrick, Adam Quinlan, Tom Johnston, and Jimmy Kinehorst. Like, they're, they're backs. Like, backs, a couple of props. Um, they've got, they haven't got any hookers, but, like, they've got, they've got a really solid, like, back line. He's here. Is he back? You can see me twice. Um, Toby, you need to put your camera on. Do you know what? That Jeremy squad is way more impressive than I would have imagined. Yeah, it is. Imagine, imagine having those, like, NRL players next to some, like, part footballers. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm literally just throwing it together now, right? Like, just writing it down. Back five, you're looking at... You're probably going to move one of these guys in or something. But you're looking at a back, back seven of Adam Quinlan, Asu Kapoa, Jimmy Kinehorst, uh, Adam Ryder from he's gone again. I don't know what's going on from Dewsbury if he's still there. Tom Johnson on the wing, and then Scott Drinkwater and Dylan Brown in, in the halves. Is he back? Is he really back? Is he back? <laughs> he's on the phone. He's on his phone. He's up. Other flip it. Flip it. Um. <laughs> so I reckon. I reckon that's a. 
you know, is that a championship side? A super it prob side it's probably. I wouldn't go as far as Super League because they have they are a bit short on sort of the players that they've got. Yeah, and obviously. But the fact that the drink, the drink in a one-off game. One game, I tell you, they're probably they're definitely beating Wales. <laughs> I don't know if I've got a reaction from there. I've missed all the conversation. I come. I was just talking about the NRL players. Slating. Yeah, no, I just said about the NRL players that could play for Germany, um, and then mixing them in with the Super League and Championship ones that you've got. Um, they haven't got a hooker apart from like they play lower grade over there. But if you go from one to eight, you've got Quinlan, Kapoa, Kinehorst, Adam Ryder, Tom Johnston, the Drinkwater brothers, David Clemmer, Josh Corrick, and then Dylan Brown in there as well. Um, phenomenal players that, realistically, you're looking at that, and it, it's good. You just wish that there was like some more. And we'll go, and I will just mention another nation. We do have another nation. I just got to scroll down a little bit. Um, come on. I've got an idea. It's literally just popped into my head, right? So we've got like sort of four or five players in each for for each of these like large um, European nations. What if we had a rest of the world team that was just like a bit like the Exiles that was just comp compromised of all the nations that don't have a team in the World Cup? What about the players? I that... reckon you could you'd build quite a strong squad. But so if, of nations that so. So when the World Cup comes around, you're saying, what are the players that could play for other nations that didn't that that didn't get picked for like their nation that aren't allowed? So like, not looking at the players that didn't get picked for Australia and could only play for Australia. Looking at yeah. players that didn't get picked for Australia and New Zealand, but could play for well or England, like, but could play for like Italy, Germany. So uh, so potentially Poland. Ronaldo Mulatalo could play for the USA. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is which is absolutely mental. Dom Young, if he doesn't go to the well, he he will be at the World Cup. We know if he doesn't get picked for England, we know he'll be with Jamaica. Uh, Wales NRL players, uh, Bradman Best. Like, if Bradman Bradman Best is fullback, Taylor Bacon's is playing in is in the championship, mate. Calm down. <laughs> All right, um, but Bradman Best, like, he's not likely to get picked for Australia. But Toby, do you see a player like that again, like? Wanting to play at the World Cup for Wales and being selected for Wales? Uh, at a World Cup, yes. Um, at a World Cup, everyone sees it as like you only get a chance to play in maybe three or four World Cups in your career. And, yeah. it, you know, you take it with whoever is offering you. The problem is, I'd rather, if he doesn't want to then play in the European Championship the following year, I don't want him. Like, it's that kind of, that's my okay. attitude towards it. Is if you're going to commit to a nation, unless you are good enough to move to a tier one nation, then I feel like a commitment to a nation is a commitment for every game that nation plays. I agree. I definitely agree with you on that. And and it's something we'll probably will speak about again and again as player eligibility comes up, especially around Origin. And we look at players that will play Origin and not play for Australia. You used to have to play Origin, and then that you have to you being fit for Australia commitments. And a lot of players dropped out of Origin because of that reason. But now you're looking at the likes of Jerome Luai playing for um, New South Wales, and he said, "No, I'm playing for Samoa," and he said, and he's committed to Samoa. And I think that's one of the problems with um, like the uh, international rules. There's there's international rules. You've got NRL rules. You've got RFL rules. You've got Championship rules. You've got Women's Super League rules. You've got Women's NRL rules. We're one sport. Like everyone could, should be able to play by the same set of rules. You've got different amount of subs for different leagues. You've got different head injury rules for different leagues where is there one set of rugby football league opera like match day rules like operational rules mm. the football have them it's not hard to throw them together like you understand the way they run their match officials and stuff is different but that's a totally different story i will let you carry on though uh, toby you had a proper you were having a proper you i know you were about to go really deep into that then no, no, no. I was just going to say that we've just had a British to see sort of clubs um, put the little flags of what what nations they can represent. I think they've been using like tribal New Zealand and Australia indigenous flags as well. Yeah. Um, really nice to sort of show people, just to show the full perspective of what um, what country um, players can represent. 
Um, and it's you know it has thrown up some interesting ones. It did, you know, that did, um, yeah, there has been Greece have got a couple of players floating around in the rabbit holes. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just nice. To, it's just been nice to see that there are so many sort of nations represented, and um, we'll see from that. I mean, there's a list. There was forty countries that the NRL have collected in total. It's mm. a full list, and that goes as far as China and Japan and North. Yeah, which um, which when you think about it is absolutely crazy. Um, he can play for one of his tweets has gone. Shows... Oh, go on. No, I think it just shows the potential growth the sport has. Yeah, um, he he can play for international sort of eligibility. Uh, one of his tweets from the fifth is from the fifth of November, and he said, "See you in May." So he's going to be a bit. He will be a bit quiet, but you can go back and have a look at what he's done. Um, he looked at uncovering player eligibility for the following nations, and he's found players in top league so he looks at super league championship league one elite one in france the nrl and then the lower the lower grades in the nrl so you're looking at their academy and their reserve grades like we mentioned before P countries he's got available he's got iran burundi israel uh syria hungary and zambia other countries he's got as italy cook islands netherlands germany and lebanon which we already know about a rugby a developing rugby league nations but the Zambia, Hungary, Syria, Israel, and Burundi, and Iran. They're countries that probably have never even heard. You mentioned rugby league in them country, and they just go, what? And you, you, I guarantee, like, those players, like, maybe not Hungary, but the others especially. It's crazy how many, how, like, how important it is to have and to know where, where your history lies. Do you know what I mean? Especially for those lads over in the NRL. And we talked about this the other day. Sam Walker for England watch <laughs> is there any is, go on and, and we were and i was talking about jason tamalola and how he led the pacific revolution for tonga as well i think there's a lot of potential that we sometimes overlook and and don't really um take advantage of you know we, we could have we could set up a, a competition in the middle east with with those countries is that yeah. that's not too difficult to to um to, to do to arrange no definitely not even if it's just a one-off and you find if you find 17 lads that would happily go and represent a non maybe like not an actual rugby league but an invitational side in an invitational tournament it'd be it, that's all you need like a one-off to just to build the atmosphere some of the best players in the world and say look go and play for serbia in this tournament like all three all four trebojevic brothers go and play for serbia in this one-off invitational tournament and increase the popularity of this sport in your country. They'd happily go... I reckon, if you said to them, you're not going to pick for Australia, Serbia in a World Cup, they'd jump at the chance to go and play for Serbia in those four. Same with Tom Oppercik and the rest of them. They would. And I think if you if you did that in like in, in two years in between the World Cup every year, just to build it, it'd be fine, I think. I'm, I'm looking forward to a Middle Eastern tour. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> a Middle Eastern tour with um, these players from... Iran. You could, send, and... you could send Great Britain over though, couldn't you? And, and you could, yeah. So you'd have all, all of those teams play each other and then you've just, just then you've got like an excuse to do it and hopefully we would bring people over there and yeah, 100%. And people who've never even heard of it would just all of a sudden be like, wow, there's this great team coming to town and you, you never know, we might we might be sat on a hotbed, it might just be perfect. <laughs> yeah, you might, might absolutely love it. Um, We'll stay, kind of stay with the NRL but not do the NRL watch. Richard Agar has walked walked out on Leeds over the last two weeks. Um, we we said it, didn't we? We said if Leeds don't win this week, he'll go. He's got to go. And we said it last time. They didn't win, and he left. Um, JJB has taken over in the interim with Sean Long still the assistant. Robin, you were saying off air you don't feel like he's the right choice to stay. Do you, do you know what I mean? You, yeah, show, you I, don't think he should be given the job full time? No, I mean, I guess it's it's always difficult when if you don't have a contingency plan in place, you you want you. I guess you, the risk is that you get rid of a coach and then your team just goes off the rails. So you you're probably looking more for a bit of consistency than you are willing to take a risk. But I think the problem with JJB is he's part of that golden generation, and the. Leeds just so desperately need need to move on from it. They're just clinging on to it, and I think 
uh, he he knows he knows that when when you hear him speak, he absolutely knows that, and he's been trying for years to change the culture of that club, and it's all you hear him talk about, and it's like at some point you've you've almost got to stop talking about it. You've just got to just yeah. pretend it never happened. And I, and I think all they're doing is just re- rehashing the past and, and bringing in another player. And I'm, I, I was reading just before we started, people are talking about Danny Maguire and even saw... Uh, Tony Ellie Smith. Hanley brought it up. Yeah. It's like, you need to stop looking at the past now. You've, you've got to move on. You didn't, you didn't transfer that um, great team into, an, into another one. Um, You've got to start afresh. I, 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 so I, I, obviously, it, when you when you've got rid of a coach and it's like we need to play next week as well, yeah, you're just going to take whoever's available. But I, I, I'd like to think that they're going to look beyond this this idea now. Yeah, I agree, hundred um, percent. Toby, Gary Hedrington has gone on a mission. He said he's going over to Australia to find a coach. They tried that before with Dave Ferner, but with Dave Ferner, he had Sinfield in his ear. He had like these players, like Robin said, the the players that have, of the that dynasty that we mentioned back back when I spoke about the two thousand eleven Grand Final. Is that the right choice? Do you think he's the right option, or do you think they need to be looking closer to home? Like, what do you think need they really need to do in terms of their their coach? What do you think is the right option for them? Yeah, I honestly don't see how they're going to find an English coach within rugby league. There might be a rugby union possibility. You know, I know there's, there's coaches who sort of, you know, who have played both um, and bring a lot of defensive skill to rugby union things. And maybe there's one who's looking for a way back. That, I guess that's a possibility. Um, other than that, I go, uh, you know, Castleford and Warrington both needed coaches. And all they could find to turn to were Daryl Powell and Lee Radcliffe, who have both been underwhelming now this season. Um, I don't, I you know, Wakefield, they, well, they turned to slash like their interim coach and money coaching, but that's something where it's not exactly promising. You're not going to appoint Chris Chester. Um, you know, I, I mean, you just look at every time a coach comes wanting to appoint a coach, and it's the same five or six names that go on a merry-go-round. Um, you know, Salford appointing Paul Rowley. Who was quite? Who had a dodgy year in Toronto, I believe, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Um, yeah. Once, once the going got tough, but in the top at the end of a championship season, uh, Paul Rowley got going, and now he's doing. He seems to be doing okay at Salford, but yeah. So it's. I don't think there is any unless you do just get a completely a, a young coach or someone from an academy or something. But then your Leeds Rhinos, um, your the team with the most consistent attendances, um, probably one of the most consistent, the, the team who's expected to be in the playoff every single year. Yeah. Um, up with there with Saints and Wigan. Um, and I think you've got to at least, you've got to do everything you can to get a coach who's going to do what Christian Wolf and Justin Holbrook did with St. Helens. Um, 100%. And that, that is by going to Australia. Yeah, I agree. They went to Australia before with Dave Ferner. And before we came on you turned you said, I don't understand why they've given Richard Agar this much time and they only gave Dave Ferner... I don't even think they gave him a season, did they? Before they said to him, you're done. Like, is there a problem higher up with Leeds? Is it a, is it a reason of if your face doesn't fit at Leeds? Or does Heverington need to go, okay, you're the coach... Like you're the you're the head coach. Anything that goes on below you is your problem. Like, I need to, if you want it, I need to, Heverington needs to go. If you want this, I'm going to give it to you, doesn't he? Now, if he's if he's going to bring in a brand new coach and change the ethos of that team. Yeah, I think like Brad said, uh, Toby said, Dave Ferdinand was sort of a little bit of a puppet, and he had he had other there was other influences that were affecting that team. So this is why I'm saying they need they kind of they do need a fresh start and yeah I think I think Australia is the option and I think like giving them control is is the best way to just you know completely reset what they've been doing because I think they've been looking short term ever since um, and they've just been trying to patch holes and recreate what they had and they almost need to to, to look more long term and yeah giving giving somebody 
the reins and saying this is this is your baby is probably the best way to get someone thinking long term, give them security, yeah. and make investments for the future rather than trying to patch holes every season. Yeah, I mean when Bradford lost to when Bradford beat Leeds in the two thousand and nineteen Challenge Cup, that was under Agar, and I said at the time, Leeds is so inconsistent because their coach is so in- inconsistent. That was two and a half seasons ago, and they stuck with him till now when they've won one in six. And if Leeds get battered by Saints at the weekend, which they likely will, like with points, it doesn't matter whether to, which out of Toulouse or Castleford win in that in their game. If if Leeds lose and that that game's a draw and goes to Golden Point, and or one of the teams wins by a very small margin, Leeds will be bottom of the table after seven games in the Super League, and they're out of the cup. Like after being embarrassed by a Castleford side, who are below them, they're eleventh. A poor cast side battered them. It. I don't know what's wrong with, with Leeds. Whether it's on the pitch. Well, it, I don't think it can be on the pitch. I don't think it's the players, because the players aren't bad. We know the players aren't bad because we've seen the players perform. We've seen Austin and Caesar perform in the NRL. We've seen their forward pack perform on at a consistent basis. Bentley's done it at Saints. Hurrell's done it. Like these lads have done it at this at at the top level. Just something going on off the field of play, not on game day, is probably is not helping them, and that and that's where it's going wrong. And I hope for the sake of rugby league, they can fix it. But as a Halifax fan and someone who doesn't and is a rival of <laughs> like of West of of Leeds and a, a fellow West Yorks club, I'm loving it. Like I said last week. I want Leeds to win because Agar will stay, but I also want Leeds to lose. Or I said it two weeks ago, if Leeds lose, I love it. But if they win, it also means that they keep Agar for longer. So, like, they'll be more inconsistent as it goes on. So, fingers crossed. I think you can... Do you know what I mean? Like similarities between Leeds and Brisbane, where they're both clubs that have really have loads of resources, really should be successful and have, like, a, like, all these great players and they just don't seem to be able to convert. So, maybe but, they need to look at Brisbane and see if they seem to be on the up this year like what have they done differently maybe they need Albert Kelly at Headingley maybe they do <laughs> but we'll move on I'll leave it on that one um Toby it's your it's your lovely segment it's one of your lovely segments again where we give you a, a rugby league badge logo this week you've got Malta Knights um the Malta national team badge thoughts initial thoughts when when seeing this My initial thoughts is Jared Samet plays for them, uh, which instantly <laughs> puts it above a five. Above, um, a, above a five, <laughs> love that. <laughs> the Samet uh, factor. You know, the, uh, the sword going through the badge, uh, actually, I really like. It kind of looks like a bit of a coat of arms. It, it slashes shield, slashes. Yeah, it's it sort of, I think it's it represents knights on many levels. Um I mean, I don't know about the heritage of Malta and if this actually means anything to the Maltese people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there we go. Um, they've got some lovely uh, imagery. Um, the rugby ball, I think, looks a little bit uh, 1950s. Um, <laughs> but the red and white colour scheme's nice. I really like how it's sort of a coat of arms. However, we've talked about badges before and how um, it's really important to sort of have more imagery, like have a have a sort of big image of the design so um and this sort of like crest type of logo is going out of style so if Malta ever want to attract you know a crowd of the whole island um this may not be the the way to the way to to go about it um but it is a solid entry and i think amongst um amongst international badges it's probably actually pretty good um so i'm going to say that it's it, it's a solid 7 Seven. Wow. Okay. Nice. But goes right in the middle. Um. I also would like to point out Sam Stone, Lee Centurion's player, is also a Malta international. So they haven't got. They've got a couple of players as we like sort of back, talk about heritage. Uh, Tyler Cassell, who's played for Manly in the NRL, Jared Samet and Sam Stone have all played for Malta. And there's probably a few more if if that he he can play for goes digging. You'll probably find there's a couple more lads that uh, played at a top level that can play for Malta, and, and it's really good to see. Um, 
three three quarters of an hour in, and, and we're time for a set of six. We we're really we're really drilling this under an hour. We're getting better at it. Uh, game one of the weekend. I've picked some tough ones this week, but we've got um, Wigan Warriors versus Hull FC. Wigan on form, struggled against Toulouse, then lost to Catalan. That that sort of that week away in France didn't help them. But they've got Bevan French back after 10 months out. They, they've got their full strength. I reckon, looking at the team, they've got a full strength team out, other than I think Tommy Lulawai is not available, I believe. Whereas Hull FC are coming off the back of a thrashing Sheffield, aren't they? And they are. And Jake Connor is still in form. Still in form. So for me, it is, I'm going to pick Hull FC in this game. Uh. Toby, where are you going on this? Are you back in, Robin, with the with the early birds? It's difficult because Wigan were defensively impeccable against Salford, um, and Bevan French coming back, and you go, oh, wh where's he going to fit in with in that spine? And all of a sudden, Tommy Lulu has gone, go on, let Joey Field play in the half, <laughs> slotting at fullback, and we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, so. I'm excited to have sort of Jai Field in the half, given how well he's playing at fullback. Um, and I will actually take Wigan uh, in this one. I'm going to back you as well. The return of Bevan French, who was unbelievable last year. Jai Field's been electric. Tommy Lulawai missing out is probably not the biggest worry for Wigan in terms of the fact that Sam Powell has been so reliable in that nine shirt for ne probably nearly a decade now. We don't realise how long he's been around for Wigan. They're, they're on form, like I said. I, I like them, and I, I'm going to go for a home win on this one in, in the Thursday night game. We go to the NRL for game two. We've got Penrith Panthers versus... I've cut a game out there. I've got the games the wrong way around. Oh, I'm an idiot. Uh, I've, oh, never mind, missed the game. Uh, game two, uh, Penrith versus Souths. Where, where are we headed on this one, lads? It's a tough grand final repeat uh, I I liked a lot of what I saw in South's attack I don't think that um, I don't think just looking down the left edge it, it's, it's not doing him justice if you believe that that's really their attack so um, I, I rated South's but I'm I'm going off form of a, a, a longer period of time um, I'm playing it safe and I'm going with Penrith yeah, I'm going to go with Penrith too. They just seem unstoppable. I think they had a 21-match winning run, didn't they, in the NRL last year before losing the playoff game and then winning every game until the final. And I don't think they've lost again this year. So they're on another, they're on another winning run of like eight games in the NRL. They've got the probably the best squad depth as well. Like Isa Yeo is top of the um, Dali M ratings. And, you're, and we're saying that that Australia haven't got, they're probably one of the weakest Australia teams in a while in terms of how they're going into a World Cup, but they've got six of the best loose forwards. Like they've got four of the best halves in the world. They're, they're still quality, but they're going into the World Cup in the worst shape they've ever looked. And Penrith are really backing them up. And Samoa have got some players that will play for them. Brian Toto. Jerome Luai will play for Samoa in the World Cup and push Samoa up the rankings just like Tamalolo did for Tonga. And for that reason, I love the way Penrith play and I love Charlie Staines as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go for the Panthers. Are we going three from three, Toby, or are you are you gonna stick with yeah, the... So in, in the grand scheme of the grand scheme of important returns this weekend, uh, Bevan French is actually only second to Nathan Cleary. Um and yeah, with Nathan Cleary coming into that squad, I don't think the Rabbitohs are near are, are as close to the Panthers um, ability-wise um, so far this season, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the Panthers. Nice triple, clean sweep for the Panthers. Uh, game three, back to Super League, eleventh versus twelfth. I didn't think we'd be saying this six games in. Eleventh versus twelfth, Castleford at home against Toulouse. Both teams only won once. One of these teams, unless it's Leeds, will be bottom of the table and bottom of the table by themselves if Leeds shock Saints at the weekend as well. Um, I, I, I'm i finding it a tough one to pick because Toulouse have started to kind of hit their groove a little bit. Um, Toby, where are you going on this one? Oh, yeah, I think it's 
think Toulouse had a huge, huge win against um, St. Helens. Um, I believe that's right, isn't it? Just yeah. Check yeah. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, a huge win. But I think that they're probably going to, they're probably running into similar issues um, this season. I think they're running into similar issues that Castle Castleford being able to Yeah. Um, Castleford in need of a win. Uh, and, you know, I think Toulouse put everything in St. Helens game and probably needed more than just a Challenge Cup weekend to recover from. So, yeah, uh, probably. I'll, I'll take Castleford, but it's probably against my better judgment given how well Toulouse played against St. Yeah, Robin, are you going to go with with Robert Toby's better ju- judgment, or are you going to stick go with him and, and go with the Tigers under a pretty shoddy Lee Radford regime? Yeah, I think we we obviously expected to lose not to do well this year. I think um, my my take on to lose was going to be that they lost they they lost the chance of staying up when they lost that game to Wigan because I thought. That was a, a yeah. rare opportunity to bag points when they when they didn't really expect them. Yeah. Um, and then they obviously lost to Wakefield, which we would have expected as a four point game. Mm. So I was ready to say that's it. They've they've lost their chance. That you don't get many in Super League. They came early in the year. You weren't ready and you've missed it. But then they beat Saints. So <laughs> that's sort of like <laughs> never expected that to happen. Um. So yeah, like like you said, they're on form. But I think I've got to I've got to go smart, and there's no reason if they hadn't have beat Saints, and if that was a fluke, there's no other reason why I can't back this terrible cast side. But still, I'm gonna back cast. Yeah, it's one of them where you kind of you really want to lose to win because yeah. we've spoke about how Cass in that stadium and the way they are, it doesn't kind of give you that Super League vibe, but. You can't see past the the win against Saints being anything other than a, a fluke, and and maybe poor prep and a little bit of compl- complacency from the Saints side, which which we know happens because they've lost to they lost to Broncos when they got relegated. They Wigan and Saints are very good at losing to teams at the bottom of the table, and maybe we shouldn't have been so surprised when it did happen. And like you said, Cass have come off the back of a really really good win. Like I know it was against a lead side that we've just ripped apart, but it's a very, very good win. Nobody puts 40 points on Leeds at Headingley that comfortably, apart from maybe when Saints do it this weekend come in. Um, and I think for that reason, I'm, I'm going to have to go Cass as well. We're going to drop down now, though. Three divisions. We've, we've been re- we're relegating ourselves, and we are in the National Conference League. Pilkington Rex at home against Thatter Heath Crusaders. Huge derby game. Up in um, up in the St Helens region, what are we expecting from this one? Because both of these teams are are like community club powerhouses who usually go quite far in the cup. And I know for a fact that both one of you is going to look at the league table and just pick whoever's top or to pick whoever's above it, aren't you? I was just going to ask, what's the league table? I'm, I've not looked at it, and I'm going to. I was going to wait for one of you two to go. I'm going to look at the league table. <laughs> I don't... What I know is that Crusaders beat Pilkington in the Challenge Cup a number of years ago. And they lost <laughs> to Tatu Heath in the Challenge Cup a few years ago. And because of that, there's only one there's only room for one Crusaders in Rugby League and I've got to take Pilkington. <laughs> but... um... yeah, I, I I was gonna go to Tatu Heath because to my knowledge they're the biggest side, but I might have just really offended loads of people <laughs> um but yeah Satterheath for me Satterheath currently fifth two wins one loss one draw um pilkington one win three losses currently ninth out of the 12 teams in the um the national conference league premier division and for that reason alone i'm gonna go for that <laughs> crusaders also because they usually go a bit further in the cup every year they seem to have a little bit more depth and they're, they're they're just there and thereabouts and and I like that in in sort of the way that they they play the, I like the way they play their rugby as well. Uh, game number five, Toby, you're gonna love this one. North Wales Crusaders at home against Cornwall in their first ever game. Uh, we know where you're going. I just want you to tell me why you're going like that. Um, I think. That this Cornwall team is the worst team to ever play in League One in terms of their personnel. Um, did you, have you, did, did you see some of them, Hemel Stags teams, by the way? I just want to point out, did you see some of them? That includes Hemel Stags, <laughs> who 
World Raiders. <laughs> with our help. Uh, and, yeah. Um, that I just, I don't think there's a single name who's even played in League One, but there is. There's Anthony Mullally. There's Anthony Mullally, yeah. I don't think that a player they've announced in the past two months has actually played even some form of semi-professional rugby. Um, Not at senior level, that's for sure. Yeah, and it's just, yeah, I just could not be excited for it. I think Crusaders, it's weird actually, they've had a a funny season where they've had some incredible defensive performances in the Challenge Cup and then they've just gone, oh, let's spin that off and let's just go all attacking and beat Rochdale by (laughs) two points in a 36, 34 game. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, they look like they're going to create themselves a season. It's going to be um, going to, well, I don't think this Cornwall game can be part of that narrative. Uh, <laughs> I'll wait for it uh, yeah, I think I think I'm in the same boat, and I, I, I don't. It doesn't take a a genius to figure out that Robin's probably in the same boat as well. But Robin, you need a two point catch up. So are you going to go with Cornwall, or are you going to are you going to stick with North Wales and just secure yourself a point? Like. It's just never going to happen, is it? It's, <laughs> it's just never going to happen. Oh, yeah, you've got to back North Wales in that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Like, don't get me wrong. I hope that Cornwall can prove us wrong and they're not the worst ever team to play in the NRL. But I am looking forward to that South Wales Scorpions. That South Wales... Is it South Wales Raiders? Or West Wales Raiders? It is, isn't it? West Wales Raiders versus Cornwall game. That'll be an absolute cracker to see which team won't finish on zero points at the end of the season. Um, last game, game oh, six... Go on, go on. I'm just saying, related to that, what I like the idea of is that a lot of these Cornwall players probably have to drive three hours down to Cornwall to then get a bus six hours up to, <laughs> up to North Wales. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! I love it. Um, last game of the last game of the of the set of six. Then uh, Wakefield three wins on the bounce, two big wins over Warrington at the Halliwell Jones. They've got Salford coming to Bellevue. I'm back in the Trinity on this one. I think it's four in a row. Willie Poaching hadn't won a game before this little run, by the way, at Wakefield. He's on. Oh, he's on one. Stuff. Yeah, he hadn't won a game. Finally got a win, and they've won two more since. Um, I think he's going to continue doing it. I really like him. I like the way that he's got them playing, and the Mason Lino return has kicked them right into the, put them right in the right. Get, just they're in there. They're just the, the wheels are turning, like they're on a roll, and I like it. And I don't see them losing an, a, this week. And if they do lose, it won't be by a lot. Yeah, how can I not back our player of the fortnight? I'm going for Wakefield. Yeah, uh, Salford. Toby, you need points, by the way. <laughs> Salford. They've just they just didn't know how to create anything against Wigan and it was quite poor to watch and I think Dan Sargentin's not available and that was sort of been quite an important part of their attack in the first couple rounds and um, yeah it's really difficult to uh, to back Salford in this given what we know but Wakefield are supposed to be bottom of the league in our predictions <laughs> and uh, Brody Croft is my favourite Salford player of all time um, so I guess I'll, I guess to try and win the point <laughs> He's gone for Salford. I've lured him into that one as well, which is absolutely unbelievable. I can't believe I've managed to do that. Um, I should point out, after last week's result, I'm st- I'm on 37 points. Robin, you're on 35. Toby, you're on 33. There is a chance that we all finish once again on equal points at the end of the weekend if everything falls into space. And you know what? That would be absolutely fantastic. So... Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me once again. This two, this new two-week schedule will continue. We'll continue to do that unless we like, and we'll continue to do that and let, until we think that we found a better option. Um, so we'll see you again in a fortnight's time with another Hall of Fame entry, another player of the fortnight, more badge ratings, another set of six, and more discussions about some, maybe a few less serious, a few fun discussions, and maybe a serious sort of a debate to throw in there as well. And We will have guests on soon. I promise you that. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Bradley. That's been Robin. That's been Toby. It's totally opposite on the way of Discord and it's really confusing me. Um, But have a wonderful weekend. Have a wonderful two weeks. Enjoy the Rugby League. Um, We'll catch you soon. See you later.